On the fifth day there sprang up so great a storm in our beam, with the sea up to the heavens, so that the cables could not hold, nor the sails serve us. And we were driven ashore with all three ships upon a beach, covered with very fine sand, shot in on one side and the other by great rocks. Such a thing was never seen, for within the space of an hour, all three ships were broken in pieces, so that there did not escape three hundred men, and more than one thousand were drowned, among them many persons of importance, captains, gentlemen, and other officials. In September 1588, three ships from the ill-fated Spanish Armada were wrecked here off the coast of Sligo in the northwest of Ireland. On board was Francisco de Cuellar, a nobleman and captain. He washed up here that stormy night barely alive, the beginning of an epic odyssey, which he wrote about after. It's an incredible and at times bizarre story, and today we're going to trace his steps as he wanders across the savage landscape of 16th century Ireland. I turned to call my companion to see if he slept and found he was dead, which occasioned me great affliction and grief. I got to know afterwards that he was a man of position. There he lay on the ground with more than 600 other dead bodies which the sea cast up and the crows and wolves devoured them, without there being anyone to bury them, not even poor Don Diego Enriquez. De Cuellar drifted in and out of consciousness. He had managed to crawl off the beach undetected and was hiding in the dunes from the natives plundering the wrecks and the English patrols finishing off the survivors. Spain and England were at war and for the impoverished natives, the misfortune of the Spaniards was their deliverance. The tide brought in gold, jewels and iron in great abundance. The bodies were stripped as eagerly as the wrecks. Two native men stumbled across to Cuellar, naked and bleeding, and covered him in rushes and grass before heading to scavenge what they could. Somehow, he survived the night. <laughs> At the dawn of day I began to walk, little by little, searching for a monastery of monks that I might repair to it as best I could, which I arrived at with much trouble and toil. I found it deserted, and a church and images of the saints burned and completely ruined, and twelve Spaniards hanging within the church by the act of the Lutheran English, who went about searching for us to make an end of us all who had escaped from the perils of the sea. All the monks had fled to the woods for fear of the enemies, who would have sacrificed them as well if they had caught them, as they were accustomed to do, leaving neither place of worship nor hermitage standing, for they had demolished them all and made them drinking places for cows and swine. Someone stole the sign. <laughs> Someone's hungry. <laughs> This is Stad Abbey. The structure is the remains of a late medieval church, though the site itself likely dates back further, back into the early medieval period. We're about a kilometre away from Strand, making this the most likely location of the monastery that De Quedar writes about. Though, of course, we can never say for certain in cases like this. What is certain is that it won't be around for much longer. If a severe storm doesn't get it beforehand, 
It's going to end up falling in the sea sooner rather than later. It's a pity to lose such a beautiful piece of history. I guess it's a reminder that nothing we build will last forever. As I did not meet with anyone at the said monastery, except the Spaniards hanging within from the iron window gratings of the church, I sallied forth speedily and betook myself to a road which lay through a great wood. When I had gone by it for the matter of a mile, I met with a woman of more than 80 years of age, a rough savage, who was carrying off five or six cows to hide them in that wood, so that the English who had come to stop in her village might not take them. De Quayer describes an almost comical communication with this old woman. Himself ragged, rough and bleeding, and she lamenting and wailing, and all the while trying to communicate in hand signals and dramatics, like some bizarre game of charades. All, all the while English patrols are combing the area for survivors and locals that may be helping them. The old woman warns De Quayer to stay away from her village, as English soldiers had been there and had already cut the heads off many Spaniards. So he decides to head back to the coast, probably to search for provisions and supplies. Near the beach, De Cuellar met two Spanish soldiers, naked as when they were born, he says, one with a bad head wound. They returned to the beach, hiding from anyone they saw native and English alike. This was the third day, and bodies were still washing up. Among them, De Cuellar saw his friend, Don Diego Enriquez. He apparently stopped to bury him so as to hide him from the crows and scavengers, a shallow pit hastily covered over with sand and pebbles. From here, they make their way to a nearby village, possibly the nearby village of Grange, meeting a man along the way. This man, by the grace of God, assisted me and my two companions, and brought us away from there, and remained a good while in our company, until he put us on a road which led from the coast to a village where he lived. There he told us to await him, and that he would return soon, and put us on the way to a good place. Along with all this misery, that road was very stony, and I was unable to move or go a step forward, because I was shoeless and dying with pain in one of my legs, which was severely wounded. My poor companions were naked and freezing with the cold, which was very great, and not being able to exist nor assist me. They went on in front by the road, and I remained there, supplicating God's favour. He aided me, and I began to move along little by little, and reached a great height, from whence I discovered some huts of straw, and going towards them by a valley, I entered a wood. In the woods, more misfortune befell De Cuellar. He recounts being fired upon and attacked by an old savage of more than 70 years in the company of two younger armed men, one English, one French, and a young girl in her 20s, whom De Cuellar describes as being beautiful in the extreme. They maltreat him, confiscate his valuables, and more grievous than that, his religious medals, which the girl hangs around her neck, signalling to De Cuellar that she is a Christian. He's not impressed though, saying, yeah, sure she is, as Christian as Muhammad. Nevertheless, she takes pity on him and provisions him with bread and milk to eat and herbs to put on his wounds. She sends a boy to show him the way to some mountains in the distance, beyond which are the lands of an important savage, very friendly to the King of Spain, and that he gave shelter to and treated well all the Spaniards who went to him, and that he had in his village more than 80 of those from the ships who had reached there naked. At this news I took some courage, and with my stick in hand, I began to walk as best I could, making for the direction of the mountains as the boy had told me. I continued travelling, little by little, towards the place that had been pointed out to me, searching for the territory of the chief who had protected the Spaniards. And reaching the mountain range that they gave me for direction, I met with a lake, around which there were about thirty huts, all forsaken and unoccupied. 
and there I wished to pass the night. This may or may not be the lake, depending on which side of the mountains the Quajar found himself. On the north side is Glenade Lake. Here on the south side is Glencar. There is more archaeological evidence for habitation on the shores of Glencar, but again, we can't say for certain. Anyway, what is certain, because de Quajar vividly recounts such, is the comical interaction that took place in one of these huts. De Quajar enters, beaten and bleeding again, dressed in reeds and matting. He thought he was alone, as did the two also naked and beaten Spaniards huddling in the dark corner. They surprise each other, both parties terrified by the other's sudden appearance in the darkness and all praying to be delivered from the devil that has appeared before them. Only halfway through do they realize they're all praying in Spanish. De Quajar says, they nearly killed me with embraces. They woke at dawn the next morning, buried in their nests of straw, and saw a native enter the hut with a halberd talking to himself. All day, the three terrified Spaniards hid in their straw as the natives went about their business, working around their huts. When night came, they escaped. We went along, stumbling in the mud and dying with hunger, thirst and pain, until God was pleased to bring us to a land of some safety, where we found huts of better people, although all savages, but Christians and charitable. One of them, seeing that I came so badly treated and wounded, took me to his hut and dressed my wounds, he and his wife and sons, and he did not permit me to depart till it appeared I should be well able to reach the village I was bound for. In it, I met with more than 70 Spaniards, who all went about naked and severely maltreated, because the chief was not there. He had gone to defend a territory which the English were coming to take, and although this man is a savage, he is a very good Christian and an enemy of heretics, always carrying on war with them. He is called Señor de Ruel. O'Rourke, an important clan in the territory of modern Leitrim, in the Quayer's time, led by one Brian de Muerte O'Rourke, all this talk of savages and huts can easily conjure up an image of some Monty Python-esque land. And, you know, maybe that's not far off how this Spanish nobleman perceived it. But some context is needed. We are in the early stages of what historians call the early modern period of history. The Middle Ages are gone. By this time, galleons had been traversing the Atlantic for nearly a hundred years. A young William Shakespeare was living the struggling artist's life in London, and Europe was in the grips of Reformation and Counter-Reformation. So, all around fun times for everyone. In Ireland, this is the period of the Tudor Conquest, or Reconquest, depending on who you ask. The Protestant English crown was struggling with the Gaelic Irish chieftains and noble families for influence over the island which was nominally administered via the king's representative in Dublin Castle. Nominally. It was a time of changing alliances and local rebellions, where religion and profit were more of a motive than any sense of nationalism or a shared idea of self-determination. These ideas didn't exist then. What defined you was your religion, how many cows you had, and who you owed your allegiance to. This is the world de Cuellar found himself in, an ill-defined patchwork of Gaelic kingdoms and English plantations. Meanwhile, the Spanish were fighting the English, the English were fighting the Irish, and the Irish were fighting each other. De Cuellar describes his experience in Ireland as a land in which there is neither justice nor right, and everyone does as he pleases. That's not strictly accurate, of course. In Gaelic territory, 
the laws of the land were well known and ancient, and English law was upheld in Crownland. Enforcing the law, of course, that's another story. Regardless, coming from Europe and Spain at that which was establishing its imperial dominance, it's not hard to see why this alien land shocked De Cuellar in both its decentralization and its inhabitants' way of life. You have to remember that Ireland is an island on the fringes of Europe, and aside from the Normans centuries before, up until this point, the island was pretty much left outside of European affairs. But all that changed in the 16th century, when the English crown recognised the danger that an unconsolidated and troublesome neighbouring land posed, especially during its war with Spain, who would find ready allies in the resurgent Gaelic kingdoms. So settling Ireland became a priority for the English crown. And it wasn't easily done. The Nine Years' War, beginning in 1593, the Irish Nine Years' War, that is, there was another one on the continent some decades later, was the organised Gaelic response to English settlement and influence in their kingdoms. It was a major conflict, and the Gaelic alliance very nearly succeeded in undermining the crown. But alas, eventually the chieftains were defeated and history took the course it did. I hope that rapid summary was somewhat coherent. Now, back to O'Rourke. Well, as de Cuellar says, he wasn't at home. The house that de Cuellar arrived at was likely one of O'Rourke's strongholds, perhaps this one, here in the townland of Castletown, County Leitrim. This is a tower house, a fortified dwelling. O'Rourke's primary dwelling was on the shores of Loch Gill, about 10 miles away, where Parks Castle is today. Of course, it's always possible that that is where De Cuellar stayed in, not here. But following the most likely path that he would take from the coast, either on the north side or the south side of the mountains, passing a lakeside village on the way, I think Castletown is the most likely place for the house that De Cuellar stayed in. The next day, the Spaniards receive word of a Spanish vessel lying off the coast, rescuing survivors of the wrecks. They set off at once, but De Cuellar, in his wounded state, couldn't keep up and quite literally miss the boat. He says it was divine intervention though, as that ship would also be wrecked along the coast. And what's worse than being shipwrecked? Well, being shipwrecked twice, I guess. So, De Cuellar finds himself once again lost and alone. Going along thus, lost with much uncertainty and toil, I met by chance with a road along which a clergyman in secular clothing was travelling. For the priests go about thus in that kingdom, so that the English may not recognise them. He was sorry for me, and spoke to me in Latin, asking me to what nation I belonged and about the shipwrecks that had taken place. God gave me grace so that I was able to reply to everything he asked me in that same Latin tongue. And so satisfied was he with me that he gave me to eat of that which he had carried with him. And he directed me by the right road that I should go to reach a castle, which was six leagues from there. It was very strong and belonged to a savage gentleman, a very brave soldier and great enemy of the Queen of England and of her affairs a man who had never cared to obey her or pay tribute, attending only to his castle and mountains, which made it strong. De Cuellar finds himself in a deserted valley. If we suppose De Cuellar set off from Castletown in the direction of the coast, but not retracing his steps on the south side of the mountains, then he would have taken a northerly path, landing himself in the quiet, Glenade Valley. Of course, if he had initially come this way and departed Castletown for the coast without retracing his steps, then he would have found himself in the Glencar Valley where we were earlier, though the general direction of the narrative and where he ends up, I think, makes his northerly direction the most logical. Alternatively, he could have taken the next valley over towards Ross Inver, 
if the priest had pointed him in that direction north towards Loch Melvin and the castle of the savage gentleman. At the end of that valley, near the shore of the lake, was an ecclesiastical settlement and Holywell supposedly founded in the 6th century by St. Maog of Ferns. Although dissolution of the monasteries was a policy enacted under the Tudor expansion in Ireland, its effects were sporadic, especially in the West. So a priest travelling the road from Ross Inver to Drum Hare is not beyond the realms of possibility. Anyway, it's all speculation. And it doesn't really matter which valley it was, because they all look the same. What matters is what happened to Duquedar in the valley. <laughs> Apparently, he was accosted on the road by a blacksmith. And he says, before him, I showed a pleasant countenance and proceeded to work with my bellows for more than eight days, which pleased the wicked savage blacksmith, because I did it carefully so as not to vex him and that accursed old woman he had for a wife. Luckily, the priest returned on the same path with eight rescued Spaniards and seeing the miserable de Cuellar, sooty and sweaty, delivered him from the evil blacksmith and his wicked wife. From here, they made it to the castle of the savage gentleman and finally, safety. saw me so stripped and covered with straw, he and all those who were there with him grieved greatly, and their women even wept to see me so badly treated. They helped me as best they could with a blanket of the kind they use, and I remained there for three months, acting as a real savage like themselves. How are you doing? for Rothflower Castle. Ever hear of it? Is that it down there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not much to see. Not much to see, no. This is what remains of Rothflower the castle of the McClancy clan, then under Tyg McClancy, who, like O'Rourke, maintained strained relationships with the Crown Governor and offered shelter and assistance to the scattered Spanish. What follows in de account is a unique external insight into the goings-on of a late 16th century Gaelic noble family. The Spaniard, typically, aroused the curiosity of the ladies of the house and won their affections by reading their palms and was soon being pestered by all the women of the village to tell their fortunes. To such an extent, he asked permission of McClancy to leave and that put a stop to that. He went native, eating and drinking with the locals, attending mass and observing their ways. He remarked on their hostility to the English, but also their hostility to each other, describing the culture of cattle raids and noting that ultimately the only ones to profit from the infighting and the raiding were the English. Speaking of which, word soon reached the castle that a large English force was marching from Dublin to exterminate the remaining Spanish and persecute their hosts. Faced with a battle he could not win, McClancy did what we have always done. He took the cows and ran. As was customary, the entire village would herd their cattle up into the mountains and wait for the danger to pass. But de Quajar and his eight companions would run no more. So armed by McClancy, they barricaded themselves in the castle the governor and his men arrived. 1,800 of them, but it was winter and they had no artillery. 
There was little they could do to remove the entrenched Spaniards. They beseeched them surrender. They taunted them. And then they hung two Spaniards right here on the bank. On the 17th day, de Cuellar says, a blizzard descended and the English were forced to lift the siege. McClancy returned overjoyed and offered de Cuellar his daughter's hand in marriage. And then guess whose turn it was to do a runner. Possessed of this information, I dressed myself as best I could and took to the road with the four soldiers. One morning, ten days after the nativity, in the year 1588. This was the end of de Quadra's time in Connacht, but certainly not the end of his adventures. A few months later, he washed up in Dunkirk in his usual style, naked except for his shirt. Yes, he was indeed shipwrecked. Again, the vessels ferrying him and some other Armada survivors were ambushed by some Dutch warships off the coast of Flanders. It was here, in Antwerp, that he penned his famous letter to Philippe II, King of Spain. Not much is known about de Quajar after this. He saw action in the army, in numerous campaigns in Europe, served a posting in the Americas, before fading into obscurity, presumably dying in Madrid, no doubt restless for the next great adventure. In Ireland, the chieftains would eventually be defeated. O'Rourke was hung in the Tower of London, McClancy beheaded. By the end of the 17th century, English dominion over the island of Ireland was assured. Despite routine rebellion, it remained this way until the last century. Since then, de Cuellar's story has captivated the public imagination. The wrecked Spanish Armada settled deep on Irish seabeds and deep in Irish folklore. He didn't know it then, but his adventures and the fate of thousands of his countrymen would be immortalised through his words and commemorated here in Sligo every September on Strija Strand. A simple ceremony for a complex time.